the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your own mind because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by, the Christ, by Christ's physical body through the death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Peace be to God. Amen. You may be seated here for reading the scripture for us, and what a powerful passage that is. Uh, it's one of one of my favorite passages in scripture, right? <laughs> if uh, if you were to look at uh, my Bible I keep in my office, my study Bible, uh, uh, there's a lot of highlighted uh, stuff in the Old Testament for sure, but I think that uh, every page in the New Testament is, I've got highlight markers on everything, and, and I write, Favorite, favorite, favorite. Now, this becomes my favorite. I love it. And I just simply love the Word of God. Amen. And the older that I get, the more that I enjoy reading God's Word. Uh, I, in, I enjoy uh, the truths of Scripture and how the Scripture guides my life, how the Scripture gives me purpose. And I look forward to many of the opportunities, as Travis had mentioned earlier, how do we fill up the pews? Well, by living out Scripture in our life, by being faithful, by becoming disciples, by sharing our testimony with others. One of the reasons why I ask people to stand in church every Sunday and to share a testimony is that if you're comfortable enough to share a testimony of what God has done in your life here, maybe you'll share it out there somewhere with mm -hmm. someone. So there's always a purpose. There's a method to my madness as a pastor. Uh, I love that passage where it says that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Hallelujah. And it said that it pleased God that all the fullness of God dwell in, in us. Christ. Jesus reveals God to us. Amen. In the old, in the New Testament, Philip asked the question after they're trying to figure out who Jesus is, and Philip just says, "Well, Jesus, if you would just, or Rabbi, if you would just show us the Father, it'll be that'll be enough for us. That's all the proof that we'll need. Just show us the Father." And as I said last week, Jesus must have wanted to take the scroll of Scripture and knock Philip right upside the head <laughs> and said, Philip, have I been with you this long? And you still have to ask, show us the Father. Because if you've seen me, amen, you've seen the Father. So Jesus shows us how we, as God's image bearers, or to carry out our life and our work. And that's what we've been looking at for the last few weeks. If we need help in understanding or grasping this truth, Paul spells it out for us in the text that Carol read for us. I would encourage you to read it over and over again. First, he describes Jesus' infinite power in creation. 
And that's in 15 and 17 verses. And then he immediately ties that to Jesus' willingness to set aside that authority, <clears throat> to set aside that power, to incarnate God on earth. To incarnate, to image God on earth in word and deed and in sacrifice and then to die for our sins. If uh, you have problems understanding that, uh, Paul says to the readers, and he says it more directly in Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 9. And Paul says that in our relationships to one another, uh, we should have the same mindset as Christ had. To have the mind of Christ. The same mindset, he says, as Jesus Christ. Who, according to Paul, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, Paul said that he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul said, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above all names. What Paul is trying to teach us is that we look at Jesus, we listen to Jesus, to understand how we are to image God in our own life and in our world and in our work. The last few weeks we've learned that we've been created in the image of God. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. We walk with God in unbroken relationship. This was how God created humanity to be. But we also understand that Adam and Eve, our first parents, Sin fall, and fell short of the glory of God. And they broke that relationship. They broke that image. And so because of original sin, we're born with a broken image or distorted image. And it is only through Jesus Christ who can restore the image of God in us because of his atoning work on the cross. So Jesus reveals God to us. That's been the point leading up to today's message. Last week we discussed that we accurately display God's glory when we learn to forgive as God forgives. Why do you think Jesus says, forgive as I have forgiven you? He's giving us an example on how to base our forgiveness with others. And if you don't think that is difficult, give it a try sometime. Because many of us, as followers of Christ, get stuck right there. Hallelujah. Right? Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you, are you having problems this morning in this as it relates to someone in your own family? I bet you 90% of the folks here would probably raise their hand and said, if I don't have a problem now, I've had one in the past. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we accurately display God's glory when we learn to forgive as Christ, God has forgiven us in Christ. And we learn to love one another as God has loved us in Christ. Last week, we looked at the story of the prodigal son. You see, because of this reconciling work of Jesus, we must pursue relationships with one another as we pursue our relationship with the Lord. That's why Jesus told the, uh, the Pharisee or the lawyer who came and asked him a question, what is the greatest commandment? Can you boil them down? Uh, so, you know, we can just follow one instead of over 800. And Jesus said, it's very simple. Love the Lord God of all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your what? Your Amen. neighbor as yourself. You see, we've been called through this reconciling work of Jesus Christ. Jesus, God was in Christ reconciling us to the Father. And Paul said, he's given to us, he's given to you 
the ministry of reconciliation. We image God in our life, in our work, in our world, and in our church. As we become ministers of reconciliation, as we forgive as Christ forgave, and as we love as Jesus loved. Here's the truth. We cannot and you cannot live the Christian life as outlined in the New Testament apart from living in a vital relationship with God and with other believers in the local community. I believe that more than anything else in the world because this is where I practice forgiveness and love is in my local church. And that's why a lot of churches and split and split and split and split. Why? Because they can't image that love and forgiveness. And so one group gets upset with another group and next thing you know, another church starts. That's a wonderful example of showing the world how we Christians can get along. If you don't know sarcasm, I think that was it. <laughs> Living in a gospel-saturated community, I believe, is God's will for your life, for my life. That's why we are to pursue loving relationships with God the Father, God the Son, being filled with God the Holy Spirit, so that we can learn to live in relationships with one another, no matter how messy it may get. And it can get messy. Mm. There's churches today that are split and hurting and are separated from their church family because they can't live in loving relationships with one another. So let me add another example then of how we image God in our life and our world. We talked about forgiveness, we talked about love, we talked about allowing Christ to be the image bearer for us. But we are also called to image God in our life and our world through self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. Self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. One of my favorite examples of this in the New Testament is found in Paul's letter to Philemon. How many has ever read the book of Philemon? I say the book. It's one chapter. Not many, because it's something that you just sort of pass over. I want to challenge you before the day's out to read the letter of Paul to Philemon. It is, you can do it in less than 10 minutes, about 7 minutes. It's one short chapter. Well, let me give you the back story. Philemon was a well-to-do Roman citizen who lived in Colossae, who likely met Paul in one of Paul's missionary journeys when Paul was going to Ephesus to start a church. Paul wins Philemon to Christ. Now remember, he's a Roman citizen, but Paul wins him uh, to Christ, and he becomes a follower of Jesus in his community. Later, when Paul's co-worker, uh, Ephraim, started a Jesus community in Colossae, Philemon became a leader and elder of the church and started a church in his own home. Now, Philemon, like all other household patriarchs in, Roman, in the Roman world, owned slaves. And one of those slaves was named, can anyone tell me? Onesimus. That is right. We have some Bible scholars here. Well, Onesimus, one of Philemon's slaves, at some point, Philemon and Onesimus had a serious conflict and falling out. Onesimus had wronged Philemon in some way. We don't know how, uh, or what had happened, but it was serious enough that Onesimus feared for his letter to Philemon. Are you with me so far? And he asked Paul for help. Why? 
because Philemon has the authority and the power to have Onesimus arrested, severely punished, thrown in jail, and even have him killed. And in the process of all of this, as Onesimus is talking to Paul, guess what happens to Onesimus? He gets saved. Because everybody that comes in contact with Paul, almost all of them turn to Christ. Well, he leads him to Christ. And he becomes a follower of Jesus. And he becomes a beloved assistant to Paul. Now, so Paul finds himself in a very difficult and delicate situation as he writes this letter to Philemon. Uh, and so <clears throat> please read the letter. Because now he wants to commend Onesimus to Philemon, but he understands that Onesimus has wronged Philemon and there has to be an accounting, right? So Paul is going to ask Philemon not just to forgive Onesimus and to receive him back into his home, but to embrace him as a brother in Christ and not a slave. Listen to Paul's heart. In verse 12, he says, I am sending my brother Onesimus to you, who is my heart. Receive him back to you as a brother and partner in the gospel. This wonderful request. In addition, Paul asked that he not account Onesimus as a slave, but as a partner in the gospel of Jesus. And Paul knows that he has the right to ask such a request because in that passage that Carol read to us, Paul said that he has rescued us. He has rescued you, Philemon, from the powers of darkness, and he has now transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. You have a new government, Philemon, over your life. Because Jesus has done this, Paul can appeal to Philemon to, in Colossians 3 and 13, where Paul says, listen, bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against his brother, Forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. You must also forgive, Philemon. It was on this basis that Paul could ask his brother, the slave master, to forgive and receive Onesimus as a brother, no longer as a slave, but a partner in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we truly see where Paul images the glory of God. Paul images Christ here. If you read that little letter, nowhere in the letter does Paul ever mention the word Jesus. And, the, and that whole little letter to Philemon. But you see Jesus all in the letter. And you especially see it when, where Paul says to Philemon, if you consider me a partner in the gospel, Welcome my brother as you would welcome me. If he has done anything or any wrong or he owes you anything, charge it to me and I, Paul, who am writing this with my own hand, I will pay you back. Do you see Jesus all over that? Because we had a sin debt we couldn't know when Jesus didn't have a sin debt. We had a sin debt we couldn't pay. Jesus had one he didn't have to owe, but he paid it on our behalf. And so we see Jesus, though not named, Paul is imaging to the faith community. He's imaging to Philemon what it's like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Receive my brother. I know he's wronged you, but forgive him. Receive him as a partner of Jesus Christ. He accepted God. You've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. You're in a new kingdom. You image, image Amen. God in the Amen. world, in your life, in your church. So do this, my layman. That is what imaging God by self-sacrifice for the benefit of others looks like right here. We also see Jesus setting aside 
the power for our own sake in Colossians 1 and 20. Kara read, making peace through the blood of the, the cross so that we might have a relationship with God. There are times when we're called as believers to set aside the authority or the power that we have either at the workplace or the home or the church, to benefit someone who may be undeserving. And here's the point. What you need to take home with you today, listen carefully. If Philemon is willing to set aside his slave owner authority over Onesimus, who doesn't deserve his mercy, and he is to take him back in a new relationship, then in this way, Philemon envisions or images the invisible God to Onesimus, to the church that is in his home, to his church family, to his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's imaging the invisible God in the workplace, in the home. And in his church. How does Paul expect Philemon and us to live out this request? Read Colossians chapter 3. 1 and 3 said. If you've been raised with Christ. Then set your mind on things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Not on things of the earth. Right? That would be vengeance. That would be hatred. That would be unforgiveness. That would be an unloving spirit. But set your mind on things that are above. On Christ, who's seated with God. Why? Because it is not natural for us to be loving, unconditionally, forgiving as Christ, or even even self-sacrificing for the benefit of others. That doesn't come natural. That's the work of God in your life and in my life. We are no longer bound, it says, by cultural mores. Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are no longer bound by cultural mores that stand in contrast to the life of God within us. You, you see, Paul says, set your mind on the things of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable of the will of God. Amen? Amen? We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We can march to a different beat a different drumbeat because we live in a different kingdom. This is what Paul is saying, and I close with this. The culture of our workplace and our world works against our life in Christ. But Jesus calls us to set our hearts, our minds on what God desires for us and in us. Now, this calls for a major reorientation of our attitudes and our values. Paul called Philemon to this reorientation. The first century Roman culture gave slave owners complete power over the bodies and the lives of their slaves. Everything in that culture gave Philemon full permission to treat Onesimus harshly, even to have him killed. But as Paul was clear, as a follower of Jesus Christ, Philemon had died and his new life was now in Christ. That meant rethinking his responsibility, not only to Onesimus, but also to Paul, to the Colossian church, and to God his judge. Did you hear that? That means that we have to rethink the new responsibility that we have. 